Hello everybody and welcome to Gears Tactics. So straight away, no messing about, the question on most people's minds is, is it like XCOM? So let's answer that and get the biggest negative out of the way. Gears Tactics is a linear story. You have story missions that are in sequence over the course of a 40-hour campaign. You get some optional side missions to do, but there is no open-ended sandbox. There is no globe map where you target locust emergence holes or anything like that. It's just missions. There's no multiplayer and there's no AI skirmish. Every story mission is a handcrafted experience with unique maps and story and dialogue, but ultimately, it is a one-time deal. You probably won't want to play it a second or third time unless you're just achievement hunting or looking to really crank the difficulty. So that's going to be an immediate turnoff for a lot of people, and I guess it should be. We've been kind of spoiled by XCOM's open-ended formula, and it really does feel like a missed opportunity here not to include the ability to do some sort of sandbox campaign, because you do recruit soldiers, you customize them, they level up, they can die, and do everything else you do in XCOM. So why not just make it open-ended? So before we get any further, do I recommend this game? Absolutely! It's one of the best turn-based tactics games I've played in a long time with a very high quality bar. It just had me smiling from ear to ear at certain times and had these really great clutch moments when plans just came together or indeed when they fell apart in spectacular fashion. There's some really neat innovations and quality of life improvements that I think XCOM 3 or other games like Phoenix Point could learn from. However, the game is on Steam for £50, $70 or €70, Euro, and that just is a lot. But wait, before you close the video and say, look, you've heard enough, and I get it, it is on the Xbox Game Pass. For those still unfamiliar with the Xbox Game Pass for PC, it's just $1 if it's your first month or $5 for returning subscribers. And for that, you can play Gears Tactics, as well as a bunch of other high-quality games like Forza, Outer Worlds, Metro, Hellblade, lots of indies, all pretty much all Paradox games. It really is a great subscription service, it's just very good value, and if the game is going to be a linear game, I think it's pretty apt to play it there. So I highly recommend you pick up Gears Tactics on the Xbox Game Pass. You need a Microsoft account, you download the Xbox PC beta app, sign up, get the Game Pass, and that's it. You just have a bunch of games then. Now I know for some of you this can be a pain to do, and I do believe you do need Windows 10 to do it, but if you don't mind putting up with the other launchers, it just, you know, it's too good to miss otherwise. Alright, so all of the big negatives are out of the way. Let's talk about the game itself, if there's anyone left watching. So, Gears Tactics is set 12 years before the original Gears of War game, one year after Emergence Day, and hours before the Hammer at Dawn counterattack. Our protagonist is Gabe Diaz, who is the father of Kate Diaz from Gears 5. We're introduced to Gabe as an ex-colonel who now just runs the motor pool. He's sort of retired, I guess, or he doesn't really actively engage in much combat, but two hours before the Hammer at Dawn strikes against the Locusts, He's ordered to get to an abandoned CIC building to retrieve classified documents detailing information about a locust geneticist named Ukon. Now what are we looking for? The most classified looking file they got. <laughs> After retrieving it, Diaz and Sid fight back through the crumbling city to get back to the motor pool, only to find it destroyed by Ukon's grubs. Diaz is then ordered by Chairman Prescott to locate and kill Ukon, but that he won't be given any supplies to do so, and he's kind of mocked for how he handled previous operations, and that creates sort of a tension between the two of them. Now Diaz and Sid will then be working to find new recruits in this devastated city, build up a crew, and track down Ukon. And that's basically the story for Act 1. I don't want to spoil anything beyond then, but fans of the lore will know where Gabe kind of eventually ends up, and you do start to see that happening as he becomes more disillusioned with Cog. Now, I've only played Gears 1, 2, and 3, so for me, he was a fresh character, but the story kind of took a back seat, really, rather than being something I felt fully engaged with. It might have been the fact that I was streaming the game, so occasionally I might have missed some things in cutscenes, or just that you could end up spending over an hour on missions before getting to the next cutscene, so it felt a little bit disjointed. But either way, on reflection over my footage, the story is actually pretty decent, and it gives you a loose framework for what you're doing and why. In hindsight, knowing the story of Gears 5, if you do already, does make Gabe a much more interesting character when you learn about his wife and his daughter. Now, not to beat a dead horse, but it doesn't seem like a character or story-driven game was really all that worth it, just instead of making a more sandbox experience. You could have told a very similar story about tracking down a locust leader with a ragtag group of recruits left over from this devastation of the Hammer of Dawn without ever really having voiced characters. You know, that, that might have just been as interesting and given the game more replayability, but let's just move on from that anyway. Alright, so let's talk combat. 
So Gears Tactics is a turn-based game where you typically have between one and four soldiers with different classes and abilities. Now hopefully people are familiar enough now with this kind of genre that I really don't need to explain the basics, so instead I'm just going to be covering what's different or more unique about Gears Tactics. Now the first thing is that the game doesn't operate on a grid. Characters can move freely in all directions. This allows maps to have less rigid cover structures and more dynamic angles, so not everything is shaped like an L or a T, but you can instead have things like a V or an O where cover wraps around things. It's something you don't really think about too much until you're back playing on a grid, which now feels very restrictive. I think they found a really great middle ground here too, because when it comes to cover specifically, it is broken into sections just like a grid. So you can easily see and snap to cover with no problems. Now it's pretty rare, but occasionally, I felt like my character should have been able to peek something, but couldn't when I was trying to do an Overwatch. But this was really rare. I think, again, I think maybe it happened twice in my entire playthrough. Now the next standout thing is the action point system. Action points are the points that you spend to do things, and at the start of a round, your character is going to start with three. What's nice about it is that there's just no restriction on the order that you do things. So if you want, you can move, then shoot, and then move again. Or you can shoot three times, move three times, or do any combination you want with abilities or whatever. You can even run out of them and then get given some and continue doing things. There's no turn order or turn cycles. You can just shoot with a character, flip to another character and then move, and then flip back to the original character and move with them if you want. So it's much more forgiving and flexible in that regard because if you know that, for instance, you need two of your shots to land to get this kill and the first shot now misses, you can then maybe just run to cover or switch to someone else to see if you can still get that kill rather than having to commit fully to doing everything before you can do something with someone else. The really unique aspect of the action point system is that if an enemy is downed instead of killed, you can run up to them and perform an execution kill. And this gives everyone else in your team an extra action point immediately. So often, you can tactically chain a few of these together to extend everyone's turns and keep that momentum building. It feels really great to pull off, and it's a great way to integrate Gears of War style executions in this type of game. The next difference is the Overwatch mechanic. Overwatch in Gears Tactics displays a cone on the ground where the Overwatch covers. Now this is obviously great as a UI feature just to know if you're gonna get caught or not, but it's also used by the AI as a sort of pin you down mechanic. Once you're placed in Overwatch, you just can't really do anything. If you try to move, shoot, toss a grenade, or do any abilities or most abilities, you'll likely be interrupted immediately. So once you're caught, you'll have to work out how to break an enemy's Overwatch. And there's certain abilities that focus on doing just that. I'll kill you all! What's up? Now as a player, Overwatch is also extremely satisfying to pull off. Your character will fire Overwatch for as many action points as they have remaining. So if you Overwatch with three action points, they'll fire three times if their Overwatch is triggered three times. It depends on the ammo too, so you want to make sure that you have enough to actually use the AP that you're ending your turn with. What's satisfying about this is that the game seems to sort of pre-calculate what's going to happen in Overwatch and almost just plays it out in real time with multiple enemies moving at once into your line of fire for a really cool uninterrupted barrage. You can also get pretty creative with it. If you overwatch an area and then you toss a grenade in, the knockback will trigger your overwatch and you'll shoot the enemy. This is a great way to push someone out of cover and shoot them at the same time. The last thing just worth mentioning is the UI and quality of life stuff. When you're looking to move your character and you want to know if you're going to have line of sight to a certain enemy, it just draws a thin line to all the enemies you're going to have line of sight of. So no more mistakes where you plant yourself down somewhere and realize you can't see the target. I mentioned the Overwatch cone already, but sometimes when you're up high or down low, you still might not know if you're going to be in that cone, especially when it's, you know, if there's cover involved. But fortunately, the game just warns you about stepping into the cone or not. When you're aiming at someone and you have a 50% chance of hitting them or whatever it might be, you can see the breakdown of why that is by pressing R and activating something called TACCOM. And this lets you see the outline of enemies and allies in case it's obstructed by terrain. When you're throwing a grenade, you're going to see its arc, where it's going to bounce, how much damage it'll do, and if it's going to kill people. Abilities have a similar level of UI, where it's just always really clear where you'll go and what you'll do. It's just great, and they seem to have really understood and thought through everything that can go wrong, but just give you clear and concise information whenever you need it. Now aside from those standouts, which I know a few other games have variations of, it is your standard turn-based tactics game. So let's go through your squad and enemy variety. You have access to five classes of soldier and each class is tied to a weapon. 
You have support, which is like a medic, and they use a Lancer assault rifle. You have Vanguard, which is a more typical assault role that uses a retro Lancer assault rifle with a fixed bayonet. Next is the Sniper that uses the Long Shot Sniper Rifle. Next is the Scout, which uses the Nasher Shotgun. And finally, the Heavy, which uses the Mulcher LMG. Each of these five classes can be upgraded in their own respective skill trees to specialize them further. Each skill tree has four branches to it that often unlocks abilities tied to the weapon that the class is going to be using. So we'll talk specifics later, but note that you do have five classes, but on any given mission, you can only ever use four characters. So you're always going to be kind of missing a component that you could otherwise utilize. In terms of enemy variety, the game is maybe a little bit weak in this respect. It does kind of release a new enemy type every few missions, but that means you are playing a few missions with the same enemies. I didn't really mind in my time playing, but on looking back, I just can't say that there's really that much variety. But what is there is pretty good, and each enemy type does provide its own set of challenges. You have your standard hammer burst drones, which are just like regular assault troops. These guys will pretty much always look to pin you down with an overwatch. Next, you're introduced to wretches, which deploy in numbers and attempt to swarm you with melee attacks. Next up, you have the hard-hitting grenadiers, which have a lot more health than will kick you out of your cover and blast you with a shotgun. Then you have snipers, which can pin you in place, preventing you from doing anything. Boomers, which use an area of effect grenade launcher to disrupt your overwatch and cover, and then tickers, which carry emulsion tanks and detonate on proximity. There are other enemies in the game as well a little later on, but that's all the enemies you'll encounter in the first half. It's worth mentioning just on the subject of cover that it's not destructible. 95% of it isn't anyway, unless it says it's destructible, something very specific like a small wooden box or a crate or something like that. But almost everything is static in the environment. Again, this isn't something I really noticed until just doing this video and I thought I should mention it, you know, that there's no blowing open a wall to create a new vantage point or anything like that. One part of the map that is actually dynamic is the emergence holes. These kind of open up with a one turn warning in the ground and then enemies will just keep kind of appearing out of them. And in order to stop it, you need to lob a grenade in there to close them over, which puts a fun spin on the combat as you'll kind of have to toss up the risk of killing what's right in front of you or preventing more coming out later. So that's most of the enemy types and weapon variety. Let's talk the mission types that you can expect. Now, generally speaking, the missions are fairly meaty. We're talking around 30 minutes for each one and pretty varied in terms of the tasks that are given to you. Story missions often change the type of thing you're doing mid-mission several times, such as protecting something for a few turns, then escorting something, then maybe extracting and finding items, while side missions are a bit more focused on just one task. So an example of a game mode or a mission mode is the torture pod scenario. Characters are encased in a torture pod and you'll have a set amount of turns to get to them before they die and unlock them. The mission starts with just two soldiers and then as you unlock the pods, they'll join your roster for the rest of the mission. Another is the supply cache. This is sort of like a zone of control mode where there's two points on the map that you need to hold. For every turn you hold one, you get a point. After you get 10, you win. It is you taking supply. I know I'm gamifying it a lot or whatever, but you're stealing supply and it's just taking turns for you to get it. Now, what makes it challenging is that the enemy are playing the same game and they're looking to hold the points, but for only a handful of the turns that you need to hold them for. So this means you have to split your forces to work on both sides to prevent them stealing the supply. If they hold it and you hold it at the same time, then it just stalls. So it's actually a really fun mode. Annoyingly, the only thing wrong with this mode, in my opinion, is when you get your supply, the mission just ends immediately. You don't have to extract or get away, which can just feel a little bit weird as you can be surrounded with enemies swarming you and then the mission just ends and it says victory. Another mode is where the map is getting carpet bombed and you have to constantly push from one side to the other as the area behind you gets destroyed. This is also really fun. It forces you to play very aggressively and not rely on Overwatch and enemies just coming to you. It's pretty funny as well as when, if you do get flanked and make some mistakes, the Nemesis bombs will just be killing the enemy behind you, so it does kind of have its advantages too. Lastly, there is also boss fights. I've only done one so far, but I found it really tedious and pretty disruptive to the fun tactical combat that I was used to. With a large hulking Brummick monster, I had to shoot its giant emulsion tanks on its back while avoiding its missile attacks. I don't want to go through the entire fight any more than that. It just took me like 30 minutes of doing the same thing repetitively and the music just felt really out of pace and started really getting on my nerves. So after about 10 or 15 minutes, it just started to feel like a massive grind. I knew what to do, I was doing it. I just had to grind its health down over time. On standby. Oh, here. 
Now, let's move on to after you complete a mission and, you know, your soldiers are gonna level up and you're gonna get, wait for it, loot boxes. Yeah, everyone loves a good loot box, right? You can actually physically get these in the map and retrieve them and then open them to get rewards like sights, grips, abilities, barrels, and other modifications. Now, as far as I know, there's no currency or any way of purchasing these, but it's just, the, I guess, the way they chose to do their reward system. It felt kind of out of place. I'm not sure why it's there, to be honest, but you could just give me the item instead of making me open a box for it. It's kind of strange, but there it is. A box and a random item based on its rarity. Fun time. Surprise mechanics. So Gears Tactics has a combination of hero characters like Gabe Diaz and then raw recruits. Now, if a hero dies, then you do fail the mission. You have to redo it. But if a recruit character dies, then you can continue if you want. You're basically given the option to recruit extra characters at certain milestones in the campaign, and when side missions appear, you can only do one side mission with them. So you'll have to divide your group into different missions, and this means you can't just focus on only bringing the same four people over and over leveling them, but ignoring the others. Now for story missions, often it's going to actually limit who you can go on a mission with. Sometimes it requires Gabe or Sid, or sometimes it bans them, depending on the mission. So again, this is just kind of like another way where you're taught to invest into other characters. Characters have their five classes as mentioned, and they can all be customized in terms of their armor that they wear and some light appearance customization. Now for weapons, different mods will give you extra abilities or enhancements, such as a percentage chance to heal after killing an enemy, or just a straight up improvement to the weapon. Now for the most part, they actually do feel like meaningful upgrades, and if you get an epic or legendary weapon mod, they are often massive game changers. One weapon sight that I got reduced all skill cooldowns for that character by two. I'm not sure how a scope does that, but either way, I combined it with one other thing and then my medics were able to actually heal every single turn if I wanted to, which felt a little overpowered. All characters can be customized with paint jobs and armor sets, but non-hero characters can actually have much more appearance customization, including renaming, though you actually can't change their gender or skin color or voices, but you can add beards to females, so that's a thing. Now, I'm not sure why this wasn't allowed in terms of changing gender, but I have a feeling I know why, don't want to say it, but either way, it would be nice just to make a squad based on my friends, because, you know, you get attached to them, you see them die, you cry a little. But because I couldn't change gender, I just slapped a beard on them and had to pretend that John was going through some particularly tough changes right now. Anyways, that's it for my review of Gears Tactics. I think the general battle gameplay is awesome, and it leaves me wanting more. The story's fine, I actually quite like it now that I've kind of gone back through the cutscenes and kind of re-listened to it. Like I said, it's a shame that it doesn't have real replayability in there, as I think this game lends itself well to a sandbox or a meta campaign of some sort. They are adding veteran missions, apparently, as a post-release thing, which give you a sort of endgame scenario, and there is also an Iron Man mode, but these things kind of feel like they're there for completionists, rather than for people who want more meaning to their missions. And because of that, I recommend getting it on the Xbox Game Pass if you're a fan of XCOM-like games, or even a fan of Gears, looking for something a bit different. It's also a pretty easy to learn entry point to the genre I feel. It's got a good tutorial at the beginning. If you're committed to Steam, then I'd still wait a little bit longer for a sale at some point, but that is generally kind of subjective for how much you feel $70 is worth to you. This is a high quality, polished, AAA take on this genre. $70 is $70 and it's kind of a lot of money for me at least. Uh, so I wouldn't be getting it immediately. And I didn't mention it, but for me, the game does run really great. My computer's a few years old now. NVIDIA GTX 980 Ti, i7-5930K, 32 gigs of RAM. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this review, got good info out of it, enjoyed it, please consider dropping a like, tell me what you think of the game, and consider also supporting on Patreon if you can. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.